Uh, welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today for this latest webinar on access to justice and environmental matters. Uh, Client Earth is providing these webinars with support from the EU Life Programme and it's in the context of a three-year project that we've been carrying out with the aim of uh, raising awareness among the legal community on access to justice rights. So in this webinar we're going to take a look at the important role that the preliminary reference procedure plays in the context of enforcing access to justice rights for members of the public. Uh, my name is Anne Friel and I'm an environmental democracy lawyer in Client Earth's Brussels office and I'll start out by giving you a brief introduction to why preliminary references have been so crucial to constructing the legal framework on access to justice in EU law. Um, I'll then hand over to my Client Earth colleague Leonor Caldera, who is our EU litigation lawyer. So she's responsible for advising client earth lawyers on all matters related to bringing uh, litigation in the EU courts, including the preliminary reference procedure. And she'll give you a, a kind of detailed overview of the preliminary reference proce procedure itself. Um, finally, we've invited Fred Log here uh, to give you a, a valuable practitioner's perspective. So Fred is the principal of the law firm FP Log, based in Dublin, and he's a leading information lawyer. And he advises a lot on access to environmental information, but he also represents a number of NGOs, including Client Earth, and a wide range of environmental cases related to the EIA Directive, the Habitats Directive, fisheries law, etc., etc. So unusually, Fred was an engineer before becoming a lawyer, and this scientific background, I can say from experience, really is a great asset when, uh, when advising on highly technical aspects of environmental law. So he's been involved in several preliminary references to the Court of Justice of the EU, um, both on the interpretation of EU environmental law and on the validity of EU measures. So before I get started, just some practical details. Um, you should be able to see on the right-hand side of your screen a place where you can ask any questions uh, that arise as you listen to the presentations. And um, please don't hesitate to post your questions there because this will really um, ensure a, a lively discussion um, at the end. Um, and there's also an area where you can, it's called the chat tab, so you can just raise whatever, any issues that you want to and make your own contributions. So yes, I highly encourage you to, to make use of those. So now to get started on my presentation. Um, on the preliminary reference procedure in the specific context of access to justice and environmental matters. So I'll explain the agenda. I'll go straight to Article 267 of the Treaty uh, on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, I think it's quite easy for um, lawyers who have studied EU law or have um, or have practiced EU law to take the preliminary reference procedure for granted. Um, but it's really important to remember just how sort of um, um, unique it is in terms of an international law tool. It allows for a dialogue between the national courts on the one hand and the Court of Justice of the EU on the other. Um, and that dialogue, dialogue really is about um, the interpretation of EU primary and secondary law, uh, as well as the validity of acts of the EU institutions, so EU secondary law. Um, it's often debated what was really intended by the preliminary reference procedure when it was included in the Treaty of Rome all those years ago, but it certainly turned out to be the most defining feature of the EU's legal order, I think. Uh, Craig and de Berke have described it as the jewel in the crown of the, of the Court of Justice jurisdiction jurisdiction and I think that puts it perfectly when you think of what it's achieved. Um, so through this procedure the Court of Justice has developed really a unique uh, legal order that relies on national courts as enforcers and, as, and appliers of EU law. Um, and through this procedure the Court has defined the principles of EU law that we now take for granted like uh, the primacy, principle of direct effect, effect effectiveness, equivalence etc. And it's also the means by which citizens can really enforce their EU law rights and feel the protection of EU law. Um, it's shaped all 
aspects of, uh, of, of EU law, um, not only environmental protection, of course, but free movement, consumer rights, social policy, etc., etc. So um, now, turning to access to justice and environmental matters specifically, um, I'm going to talk about this and uh, split it into two different categories. Uh, so first of all, um, we talk about access to justice at national level. So this is about the ability for individuals and NGOs to challenge national measures that breach uh, EU environmental law. And the Court of Justice has really developed this legal framework through interpretation references uh, to the Court of Justice. Um, so when we talk about access to justice and environmental matters, we usually think of the Aarhus Convention as the starting point, you know, the international treaty that lays down the right of access to justice uh, in international law. Um, and that was ratified by the EU in 2005. But long before that, actually, the Court of Justice had already established that um, individuals who are concerned by directly effective provisions of EU environmental law can invoke them in national courts to challenge measures that, um, that, 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 that breach them. Um, so I just put some of the case law there. The point of this presentation isn't to really go into the detail of what these cases actually established. That can be found in the, in the materials that we have uh, developed during this project and which I'll tell you more about at the end. Of the, of, this, of the webinar. Um, but I just put up some examples there. Um, but as you know, uh, once the Aarhus Convention was ratified in 2005, some of its provisions on access to justice were transposed into the EU environmental law directives, most notably the um, Environmental Impact Assessment Directive and the Industrial Emissions Directive. And again, here, the Court of Justice has been really instrumental in um, uh, interpreting these provisions all through the preliminary reference procedure and um, really giving, giving uh, the public effective rights. Um, unfortunately, most, uh, much of Article 9 of the Arhus Convention, which gives access to justice, um, has not been transposed into EU law. So there is no kind of horizontal access to justice directive as yet. Um, but the Court of Justice has been uh, very active in ensuring that um, those rights that are contained in the Arhus Directive are um, enforced at, at national level. And it's done this quite recently um, through, through relying directly on the Arhus Convention, Article 9, in conjunction with the Charter of Fundamental Rights to ensure that uh, NGOs and individuals can reach national courts to challenge national measures. Um, so basically this means that thanks to the court, we can say today that we have a very strong and detailed EU legal framework on access to justice, um, despite this lack of an, of an EU directive. Um, however, that's not to say that problems don't remain. Of course they do. Um, because basically this, this, these rights have been developed through the case law, this means that um, courts, national courts, have to rely on a very complicated patchwork of, uh, of European case law that, they, that um, if you're not an expert in it, it's quite hard to master. It's quite complicated and, and far reaching. Um, also, it means that um, all of these preliminary reference procedures and the case law, they arise out of specific uh, disputes. And that means that it's quite um, reactive in nature. So we're still really lacking that kind of Pro, those kind of proactive choices of the co-legislators that we would have if they were to um, transpose access to justice rights into a directive. So uh, Client Earth still very much hopes that we'll see a directive in the future. Um, another problem is that uh, because access to justice rights are really de being defined through the preliminary reference procedure, when uh, NGOs and individuals can't actually get into national courts because of um, access to justice barriers such as you know problems in establishing uh, legal standing or because of um, uh, disproportionate legal costs for example it means that some of the really crucial questions that should be being asked of, this, of the court of justice 
are simply not getting through to them. So that is um, that continues to be a kind of central irony in uh, in this area of law. And finally, you'll see from the next presentation of my colleague Leonor that um, it's still the case that many national judges are reluctant to refer questions to the Court of Justice. And statistics show us that this reluctance is prevalent in some specific member states in comparison to, to others. Um, I'm now going to move on to um, right of access to justice to challenge EU acts that breach environmental law. Um, and here we're talking mostly about um, preliminary references on the validity of EU acts. So there are, um, in theory, three different avenues for challenging the acts of the EU institutions. Uh, the first one would be through direct, direct access to the general court of the EU in an application for annulment, and this is um, under Article 263 of the, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, unfortunately, the standing criteria for using this article um, have been interpreted by the Court of Justice in such a way that no individual or NGO has ever been able to uh, have direct access before the court to enforce uh, environmental law or with the aim of protecting the environment. Um, that continues to be a, a very big problem um, for environmental protection in general and for compliance with the access to justice rights in the Arctic Convention. So to kind of try to make up for this, when the EU ratified the Arctic Convention, it um, adopted a regulation that allowed for administrative review of EU acts. Uh, unfortunately, up to now, this has really not worked very well either for, for NGOs because um, the category of acts that can be subject to this administrative review are so, so narrow that it really can't be used for, um, it can only be used for two types of decision on chemicals and GMOs so far. Um, but watch this space because the Commission has just um, published its proposal to amend this, uh, this procedure this, uh, this mechanism, um, and so we're hoping that this will bring greater opportunities to be able to um, challenge EU acts that breach environmental law in the future. And we will actually do another webinar specifically on that um, uh, legislative proposal at some point uh, later in November and December. Um, so finally, Preliminary reference is really the only other method or only other avenue that members of the public have to challenge acts of the EU uh, bodies. And uh, obviously it's, it's very valued. However, there are very many problems associated with this avenue because as we know, and as I told you before, it relies on NGOs having access to national courts, which isn't always the case. Um, because of problems with legal standing and other, and other practical problems as well. Again, there is that problem with the reluctance of national judges to refer questions on the validity to the Court of Justice. And really very importantly, the, the preliminary reference procedure takes valuable time. And that means when you're talking about challenging uh, an act that breaches environmental law and therefore risks um, imposing severe environmental damage, then waiting those years while you first make uh, your uh, while you challenge first of all a national implementing act, um, and then waiting for uh, a reference to the Court of Justice. By the time that this has happened, it's a matter of years, and often the environmental damage has already been taken place. Has already taken place, and of course, as well as that there is the issue of the legal uncertainty for, for business as well. And um, this is why the UN body that's responsible for compliance with the Aarhus Convention, which is the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee, has found that this, uh, this avenue to challenging EU acts, it does not really make up for that lack of direct access to the Court of Justice. Um, so that's, uh, that's where we are today with them. Um, access to justice uh, to challenge EU acts. So now having kind of placed the preliminary reference procedure into the context of access to justice, justice and environmental matters, I'm going to let my uh, colleague Leonor take over and really get into the nitty gritty of how to use it, uh, 
what it is and uh, and what what the preliminary reference procedure consists of. Thank you, Anne, for that presentation and introduction. Um, I will share my PowerPoint now. Okay, so we'll be going a bit back to basics and explain some legal aspects of what the preliminary reference procedure is and how it works. So if you don't know anything about the preliminary reference procedure, in very simple terms, um, it is when national courts are faced with EU law acts and they have questions or doubts about how to interpret it or, or regarding the validity of that act that is necessary to solve their case. And when faced with these questions or doubts, the preliminary reference procedure allows in case of voluntary references or obliges in case of mandatory references to refer this question or this doubt to the Court of Justice uh, in order to, to require guidance from the Court of Justice on, on how to interpret it or um, on how to consider it valid or invalid. Faced with this reference from the national courts, the Court of Justice will reply and issue a reference judgment, which is, um, will be able to guide the national court on how to interpret or, or how to view the validity of that act. Um, when the national court receives the reference judgment from the Court of Justice, he will decide on, on the case. So it's not the Court of Justice job to, to solve the case, it's just to provide guidance um, and interpretation and the validity of EU acts. So first we'll see the legal framework and um, some landmark judgments. As Anne pointed out, the, the main article to consider is Article 267 from the Treaty of Function of the European Union. The blue, plight, the blue parts highlighted will, will be the main topics that will follow this, this presentation. So first, we'll, it's worth noticing that, um, as you know, the Court of Justice of the European Union is divided into the General Court and the Court of Justice, and the preliminary reference procedure is, is only directed to the Court of Justice, so the General Court is not in, present in this procedure. Also, in the first paragraph, we see right away the, the difference between preliminary references of interpretation and preliminary references of validity. Then um, in the second and third paragraph, we have a mention of any court of tribunal of a member state, which is the national court. Uh, in what regards this passage is worth noticing that there is settled case law of the court of justice uh, mentioning that arbitration is excluded from this procedure, uh, which is something that a few legal practitioners are curious if it will change um, in the future, considering the, the increased in importance and relevance of arbitration. Then um, there's also a different dichotomy between the second and the third paragraph when you see that um, the, the second paragraph you, you read the, the court may and the third it says shall. So in the, in the second one you have a voluntary reference and in the third you have uh, the mandatory. And the last one as regards the, the urgent uh, preliminary reference procedure um, which will be outside of the scope of this presentation. So getting started in validity reference and not getting into much detail because Anne already covered um, a big part of that. We have um, obviously the validity references apart from the uh, build for annulment um, a method of controlling the legality of EU acts. But although they, they have the same grounds for, for the validity reference as it is mentioned on the third point of this slide, um, they have the exact same grounds but they are different in what regards the, the standing. So as, as you know, the appeal for annulment is only available for individuals and NGOs if they are directly concerned in the act that is contested and that is not the case uh, in the validity references because this is at national level. So um, as, as we know, national courts are the, the primary responsible um, for ensuring, for analyzing this um, validity of EU acts. 
also the the judgment for validity of eu act takes into consideration uh, obviously other aspects of eu law so primary and secondary eu legislation general principles of european law agreements in which the european is part of and other principles of international law um, apart from the validity references we have interpretation references so uh, the scope that the article 267 defines for the interpretation references is broader than for validity as we've seen um, the validity of eu treaties is not uh, to be questioned so um, but it is to be interpreted so eu treaties primary eu law is included in the in the interpretation references so apart from the eu treaties you have eu secondary legislation as well then um, it is also settled that international agreements binding on the EU are also to be interpreted by the Court of Justice. And usually, as a rule of thumb, obviously, national legislation, national law is not to be interpreted by the Court of Justice, but it is to be interpreted by the national courts, except if they mentioned uh, specifically EU law. Uh, this could be national legal provisions that result from the transposition of a directive or of a certain aspect of a regulation. This is also open to the Court of Justice interpretation. In very practical terms, what does it mean to interpret an EU um, law act? It means to define its material scope of application. It means to define its recipients, who should be complying to this provision, its effects and its consequences, but also its primacy over other acts or its direct effect over um, national law. In practice, and I'm sure uh, Fred will be uh, talking a bit more about this, as, as we mentioned earlier, it's not for the Court of Justice to solve the disputes. That's the, the national court's job. But it's not for the court, of, the, the court of Justice to issue a very abstract, almost theoretical or academic judgment. The Court of Justice must consider the facts of the case uh, in order to comprehend the dispute and, and provide the correct interpretation for, for those facts. But, but there's a balance to be found in this um, in this judgment of reference, this this preliminary reference ruling from the Court of Justice between a decision that is too abstract and too theor theoretical and solving the dispute that is obviously ultra vires. Um, so it's between this balance that is very sometimes very hard to 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 do that you can find a true dialogue between national courts and the Court of Justice a true judicial cooperation um, in construction and developing uh, European legislation. Then let's move on to a different dichotomy from the validity and the interpretation references. You have another aspect to consider. When is it mandatory and when is it voluntary to, to refer a question to the Court of Justice? So the Article 6267 tells us that it is mandatory when there are there is no judicial remedy under national law and uh, um, for a few decades ago th there was a discussion between those who consider that no judicial remedy meant that only the highest court of a judicial system could refer to to the court of justice and no intermediary court could refer it because in theory that system that legal that national legal system allowed for uh, a higher inch instance as a result there wasn't so many um preliminary references directed to the court of justice but then this was solved in 64 in the case costa versus nal when the the amount of the dispute was very small so the the intermediary court in italy was actually the last um the last instance of the appeal um the losing party could not appeal despite italy obviously having a higher court um, today, it is uh, settled case law that what what you should consider is the dispute, uh, the concrete, the specific dispute that is um, that the the reference is included in. If there is no possibility of appeal, then then that reference is mandatory when faced with the question. Um, and this is for interpretation references because, as we've seen in case um, that that is the number is three. 314-85, photo frost is landmark judgment regarding preliminary reference procedure. The Court of Justice reserved for itself the jurisdiction to judge on the validity of EU acts 
So the Court of Justice will not judge on the validity of national law and the national courts will not judge on the validity of EU law. So when faced with the question regarding the validity of EU acts, even a first instance court should refer mand mandatorily to the Court of Justice. So obviously, if you have an obligation, there must be consequences for breaching that obligation. Otherwise, you don't have an obligation very, very uh, clearly. Um, and the consequences, the legal implications of not referring to the Court of Justice when you should have have are um, a bit under discussion currently, not very clear, but we could point out three different scenarios. First, a possibility of that state being uh, condemned in an infringement proceedings. We have a few, uh, the first precedent is in 2003, there was infringement proceedings started against Sweden, but um, in, at the end, Sweden was not condemned and the, court, and the case was closed in the middle. But uh, we have a very recent judgment from 2018 where uh, the Commission sued France in an infringement proceedings and actually France was condemned because the Conseil d'État did not refer a question to the Court of Justice in tax issues when they should have had. Um, so this is a consequence, the consequence that parties should remind their national courts um, if they want their national courts to refer a question to the Court of Justice. Uh, if you don't, you should, and if you don't, you could, you could be faced with an infringement proceedings. Also, we should consider the possibility of state liability between the, before individuals and NGOs. So the EU obviously provides the individuals and, and NGOs with rights, and these rights should be enforced in the front line by the national courts. And, and if there was a, a mandatory reference to be made that the Court of Justice, that the National Court did not refer to the Court of Justice, the decision might be final, but the, in, the individuals and NGOs still have the possibility to claim damages for not seeing their rights enforced. In this case that I mentioned here against Austria, Austria was not condemned in state uh, liability, but in the reasoning of that decision, the Court of Justice is very clear that if the mistake is serious and very obvious, very manifest, if it's so evident that there was a question in, in need of referencing to the Court of Justice and the, and the National Court simply ignored it, and if the, the mistake is very serious, we could, the state could be faced with state liability and compensate for damages. Lastly, um, the third route of legal implications is the obligation to review past administrative decisions. So this actually goes against the, goes, puts into question the principle of rejudicata of national decisions benefiting from the correct and uniform interpretation of EU law. So if an uh, administrative act is uh, questioned in the um, national level and no references, no references made to the Court of Justice, and then later the Court of Justice finds out that a certain interpretation or validity judgment is in a certain way, and the uh, decision from the national court is already final. There could be grounds to reopen that case and start that judgment all over again, considering the correct interpretation as defined by the Court of Justice. So this is also um, a big consequence to consider. So apart from the, the mandatory references, we have voluntary references. We've seen that validity references are always mandatory and are always to reserve for the Court of Justice, and that interpretation references can be mandatory if there is no other possibility of appeal. But when there is possibility of appeal, the court actually has the freedom to decide if he wants to refer to the Court of Justice or not. Um, and to, to answer this, this question, one must think if the doubt that the national court is facing regarding EU, EU law, if it's crucial to, to solve their dispute, if after consulting past decisions, past case law of the Court of Justice, if there is, if there is not certainty as regards to the correct interpretation or validity judgment, and considering that the, court of, the, the national court has a doubt, then the Court of Justice is better fit to interpret or to judge on the validity than the national court. Um, in the case of Gasparini in 2006, uh, the, the national court referred to the Court of Justice a question that was hypothetical, and the Court of Justice said it cannot be hypothetical, it has to be concrete to your dispute, it has to be crucial to, to, to solve your dispute. If it's not crucial to solve your dispute, then 
you, you shouldn't use the, the reference judgment procedure. So as opposed to, to the decision to refer to the court of justice, you have the other side of the question. When, when shouldn't you, re you refer, refer to the court of justice? There are two aspects to consider. Uh, the first one if, is, is if the EU act is very obvious, the command is very simple and very obvious, and you, could, you, can, you cannot even think of a different way to interpret it. Uh, and this has the, the landmark judgment of Silfit in 1982. This, the, this landmark judgment is very used in, in national level litigation when one of the parties invites the courts to refer. Uh, obviously, there is a question here, please, national court, refer to the court of justice. And then the counterparty will reply, no, this is very, very obvious and so simple. Um, so, this is, so this is very, very used in practice. But oftentimes, um, you acts uh, refer to the court of justice are not obvious at all. The second aspect is if you can find a settled case law of the Court of Justice that very clearly defines the correct interpretation and validity. So almost as if you could guess what the Court of Justice will reply to your question. Um, but this has to be used with caution because this uh, case that I also mentioned here, um, 34 slash 79, it was a case of a voluntary reference because it was intermediary courts that when faced with the question of EU law thought, no, this is very obvious, very clear, and besides that, we already have a previous judgment of the, the Court of Justice guiding us um, through this. So he decided, the, the intermediary court decided in a, in a certain way. Then the losing party appealed to the higher court and the higher court decided, no, this is not obvious at all. We will refer to the Court of Justice because now it is mandatory. And the Court of Justice agreed with the higher court and said, no, this is not obvious. And actually, our, our view, our interpretation is very different. So the outcome of the courts, um, the outcome of the case ended up being, being very different. So uh, the main idea here is if you have a question of EU law, refer it um, because the, the Court of Justice is, is the better fit to do, to do that. So when you refer to, to the Court of Justice, the Court of Justice will reply and issue a reference judgment. So now we'll see some as, as aspects of this judgment. Article 65 of the Rules of Procedure tells us that the reference judgment is binding from the moment of its publication, and usually it has retroactive force, which uh, is already in line with one of the consequences that I mentioned in, in a while ago. This reference judgment is binding on the court that submitted the question, very obviously, because otherwise it would not ensure the uniform in application and interpretation of EU law, but also on other courts, other national courts that have the same domestic procedure with the same question and similar cases. And uh, since the Court of Justice has jurisdiction to, to interpret and to, and to uh, judge on the validity of EU law, no national courts can decide otherwise. Uh, it's not the, the court of justice job to, to decide on national law, and it's not the national court to decide on EU law after the court of justice made the judgment. When the court of justice issues a judgment regarding interpretation or um, judging on the validity or invalidity of an act, that judgment, that decision becomes a part of that act. So when, for future, cases, when you are applying or interpreting certain acts, certain provision, you should always consider um, past reference judgments made by the Court of Justice. <coughs> um, reference judgments are not subject to appeal. They are made by the Court of Justice and they are final. However, parties can make requests to can ask the, the, um, the national court, because it's the national court's uh, job to make requests to clarify or to bring new perspectives considering the facts of the case. So these small requests post the, um, the reference judgment could actually clarify or slightly change, but otherwise the decision is final. Also, you should consider, even if you have settled case law, that um, the Court of Justice is also always evolving in their, in their positions and their, and their reference judgments. For example, the theory of the primacy of EU law 
before national law was all developed through preliminary references. Decades of decades of national courts requesting the courts of justice. We have this treaty, we have these provisions, how should we implement it, how should we, we interpret it? And this is a very dynamic form of legal integration through the, the court of justice that reference by reference is building um, the national, the, the European law. So even if you have settled case law, this is more of a, an incentive to, to refer it because you never know. Just a quick uh, reference, also making, um, connecting to, to Anne's presentation earlier. Um, since the access of individuals and NGOs to the court of justice is very limited in regards to standing and also cost of procedure, it is the national court's duty today to ensure that the rights given that the EU rights given to individuals are enforced. So the preliminary reference procedure is actually the, um, the, the way that individuals and NGOs can enforce their EU rights, even if in indirectly. Since this is their primary uh, access to justice and, and ability to enforce their rights, it is very important that national legal systems make um, this access um, available for individuals and NGOs. And when the access to the preliminary procedure, procedures is um, weakened or is not so easy for individuals or NGOs to access this procedure, obviously their right to effective judicial protections is, is compromised. So, so obviously we have improvements to make, but as of now, the preliminary reference procedure is really where, where individuals can, can have the access to justice that they should have. Moving on to statistics. In the Court of Justice website, we have access to the latest statistics regarding the um, 2019 and 2015 four-year period. And just as a, uh, in the first instance, we can see that the preliminary reference procedure amounts to the vast majority of the Court of Justice judicial activity. They amount to 70% of the completed cases in the past four years. So you can see the relevance that this procedure actually has in the EU litigation. Also, not only are they the vast majority of the judicial activity, they're also increasing as opposed to other types of actions. Um, in, the, in the past four years, since 2015, they have increased an average of 6% six, six a year. So, so that is also good news, considering this is the, the principal tool we have at our disposal. And finally, a very uh, curious aspect of this is to see the breakdown of preliminary reference procedures between, court, uh, between countries. And this also we have to take into account the population of the countries. And if we, we take this into account, we can see that Belgium and the Netherlands are really the champions of the preliminary reference procedure. And uh, also Germany has, Germany and Italy have the, the, the biggest amount of preliminary rulings. And this, uh, we have to say that this is not because these, these courts are, have more questions about EU law or are more insecure, so they need the Court of Justice to help them. It's actually the opposite. It's because they are more aware that sometimes um, solving disputes has more to do with European law than, than national law uh, more, more and more every year. And it's very obvious when, when we are talking about directives and regulations that we are talking about European law. But sometimes this procedure goes under the radar when we are talking about national provisions that are transposing directives or are specifying uh, smaller aspects of regulations and national courts and also the parties, because the parties can, in, can invite the court to refer, do not even think of, of uh, this procedure. And as we've seen, sometimes it's mandatory and there are consequences. Also, we can see that the, the countries that joined the EU more recently do not have um, much cases of preliminary reference procedure, which also justifies this lack of awareness. So if we would um, do a campaign to, to bring awareness to, to legal practitioners, lawyers and judges, I'm sure this, these numbers would be very, very different in, in a four-year period. So lastly, the four main ideas that you should take from this uh, 
basic presentation about the preliminary reference procedure uh, is first, this is the, the, the way to ensure uniform interpretation and application of EU law. And because this uh, um, allows for the uniform application and interpretation of EU law, obviously it's fundamental in the bigger scheme of things in the European project to ensure the legal integration in the EU. Also, as we've seen, it's the biggest form of access to justice to the, Europe, to the, to the Court of Justice by individuals and NGOs um, until, we, until we improve the system and, and broaden the, 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 the standing of individuals and NGOs. And also because it is a dialogue and because it is um, a method of cooperation, it is a, a unique Me mechanism of judicial cooperations between national courts and the Court of Justice, and this is a very interesting uh, legal phenomenon. And that's it for me. I'll pass the mic to Fred. Okay, I'm just waiting for my slides to appear. Okay, well, I'd like to thank Client Earth and Leonor and the sponsor for um, inviting me to give this presentation. Uh, so what I'll do is talk about the practitioners or the practical aspects of preliminary references, both on interpretation and in validity. Uh, and kind of, it's kind of a unique scenario in that it's a single project has given rise to the possibility of both uh, a validity reference and an interpretive reference. Uh, and I'll describe that. Um, so, <clears throat> so the, the context of this is a project in Ireland called the Shannon LNG Terminal and Connecting Pipeline. And, and what it is, it's a proposal to import liquefied natural gas into Europe via a, a terminal on the west coast of Ireland. Uh, and the issue with it is, is that the, the gas source is primarily fracked gas from the US. So there's, so there's very serious environmental issues, climate change issues uh, with that. Uh, and it's something that uh, there's a fairly organized campaign in Ireland, in the US and in Europe uh, against liquefied natural gas and, and frack gas in general. <clears throat> so it, it raised a few issues about the, the application of uh, the Habitats Directive in Ireland and the transposition, and also about the validity of a European uh, regulation that uh, is is designed to uh, provide for trans-European uh, energy networks. So the project itself was a planning permission to build a gas terminal in this area in the, on the west of Ireland. It's called the Shannon Estuary, um, and it's obviously it's close. It's the close one of the closest points to the US uh, for shipping. So it's relatively attractive to um, to importers, and there's a gas pipeline in the area, which then connects into the European network. Um, the for the environment, there's two uh, European sites. There's uh, the Lower River, River Shannon SAC, Special Area of Conservation, which has uh, kind of mud flats and salt marshes, and is also a habitat for a bottlenose dolphin, which also have protection under. Article 4, strict protection of the Habitats Directive. And there's also a special protection area under the Birds Directive, the Habitats Directive for uh, winter birds and water birds. And it's the, probably the most significant winter bird habitat in, in Ireland. And there's 50 to 100,000 birds visit there during the winter every year. So this pretty, it's pretty significant uh, in terms of habitats. Um, and obviously that's the place where you want to build a gas terminal. Um, if you if you wanted to pick somewhere, that's where you'd pick, obviously. <clears throat> so the the applicant, my client, is Friends of the Irish Environment. Uh, it's a non-governmental ENGO. It's been in existence for over 20 years, and it campaigns to implement EU environmental law in Ireland to protect the built and natural environment. Uh, the main areas that it operates in are regulation of peat, uh, climate change, air quality, aquaculture, agriculture, fishing, uh, forestry. <clears throat> so uh, my apologies for the slides, but this is, is kind of a pretty detailed chronology of uh, the project. So it was initially 
su submitted for planning permission in September of 2007. Uh, and it was brought in under kind of a fast track procedure for strategic, uh, strategic infrastructure. Uh, after the planning permission went in, but before the permit was granted, Ireland's implementation of the Habitats Directive was condemned by the European Court of Justice. Uh, and then the planning permission was granted in March 2008 and a, with a condition that the construction be completed within 10 years. Um, in the meantime, there was a modification to the project. Uh, and then also in October 2013, the project was entered on the list of projects of common interest for gas infrastructure under Regulation 347-2013, which is called the 10E Regulation, which is designed to um, provide for the construction of kind of pan-European energy networks, uh, including for gas. So because of the financial crisis and because of various other kind of regulatory issues, no construction took place within the 10-year period. Uh, so before the permit expired, the developer applied to extend the planning permission period by a further five years. And he did this by trying to vary the condition which imposed a 10-year time period for construction. Uh, on the 30th of March, the permit expired with no work having commenced. And then on the 13th of July, 2018, the competent authority granted the variation and allowed the appropriate period for planning permission to be extended by five years, even though the permit had expired. Uh, in doing so, they said that there was no material alteration to the project so that there was no environmental impact assessment required and a stage two appropriate assessment was not, not required, uh, basically because they said that the extension of time in and of itself didn't have any effect, uh, even though it was argued in public submissions that they had to update the assessments due to changes in the environment um, and various other reasons. So on, on September, in September 2018, uh, my client then initiated judicial review proceedings challenging that decision um, against what's called Board Panala, which is the competent authority in Ireland, uh, and the developer, which is uh, Shannon LNG. So the, the grounds for the challenge were that um, the screening for appropriate assessment under the Habitats Directive was unlawful because the SPA boundary had expanded since 2008, that there were uh, specific conservation objectives were adopted, uh, including updated dolphin surveys, and that the uh, the screening, the previous screening, had relied on mitigation measures, which itself had been condemned by another Irish case, People Over Wind, um, since the, the original permission had been granted. And, and we also argued that the competent authority had no jurisdiction to extend the period for an expired planning permission. So the response from the competent authority was that it was impermissible to indirectly attack a permit that was granted in 2008 and modified in 2013. So this, this is in our language is called a collateral attack, um, that, they, that there was no screening for a appropriate assessment was needed because an extension of time did not alter the physical characteristics of the project. And therefore it wasn't an agreement for the purposes of Article 6.3 of the Habitats Directive. Uh, and even though they did a screening, it was basically an ad hoc screening and non-statutory, so it couldn't be challenged. There is no legal requirement to assess the overall project, and it would be unfair to the developer if um, they couldn't extend the period because the delay was their fault. <clears throat> so just to give a little bit of background, um, like the because of the financial crisis, this, this kind of extension of time has come up a few times. Uh, because uh, the, the the financial downturn has uh, made it has, has has kind of changed the the environment for particularly for large infrastructure projects. So there was the first case on this in Ireland was called Merriman versus Fingal County Council, um, which my client was also involved in, and that was to, to do with the extension of the planning permission to build a third runway at Dublin Airport. Uh, and in that case, the court found that there was no requirement for appropriate assessment for an extension of time. Um, there's, there's also been European case law focused on extensions of operating periods. So, for example, inter-environment vol um, uh, and there's, an, uh, there's a Brussels airport case as well. But there would never really been um, one about the extension of the planning permission period for construction. 
a slightly different scenario. So, um, so that that's what the aim of this, or this that's what this case turned out to be primarily about. So, in the judgment, the court found that the competent authority had used the wrong procedure; that they should have used a procedure that's specifically intended to extend time uh, and is 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 more compatible with EU law, rather than trying to vary the terms of the planning permission itself in relation to the appropriate period. But that that was met with the objection that it hadn't been pleaded. So the court then went on to look at the grounds that had been pleaded in relation to the to the Habitats Directive, and then decided to make a preliminary reference to the Court of Justice, asking essentially these two questions. There was a few few questions, but these are the two main ones that were asked, and and the references there are C two five four nineteen. If anyone wants to look up the the judgment and the opinion, so basically, the court asked whether the decision to extend time for a planning permission was an agreement for the purpose of the Habitats Directive, which would have brought it within scope of Article 6.3. And then if it was, uh, what considerations had to be taken into account? So th these are pretty fundamental questions about extensions of time for planning permission that had never been answered or never been asked before. So um, it was, it was, uh, it's a pretty, it was a pretty fundamental questions to be, uh, to be asked. So, so there was. An, I'm not going to talk about the AG's opinion because it was broadly adopted by the court. Uh, surprisingly for us, in a kind of common law uh, tradition, there was no hearing. Um, and then in the judgment, the court said that the extension of time is an agreement. Uh, that the extension of time for a lapsed per permit is a new consent for the purpose of the EIA directive, and therefore also an agreement under the Habitats directive. Uh, that it is permissible to take into account earlier consents if they contain complete, precise, and definitive conclusions that are capable of resolving scientific doubt, uh, and provided there are no changes in the scientific or environmental information, uh, no changes to the project, and no kind of new plans or projects that must be taken into account. Which, which in, in essence means that even if there is a uh, an earlier assessment, you still have to check that there are no material changes which would call the conclusions of that assessment into question. Uh, which, which, from my point of view, from a kind of environmental point of view, this is this is pretty obvious, but um, uh, had been had been vehemently resisted in in earlier cases um, that you didn't have to revisit assessments if you're just extending the time. And then they said there's a full assessment needed where there's no assessment done at the original permitting stage. So the upshot of that was that, and it's just recently the. Competent authority has conceded that the decision will be quashed, and um, that's more or less the end of the matter. So, so that's kind of the traditional path that you take with a preliminary reference. It's kind of up to the court, really, at this stage to to refer um, the, the 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 jurisdiction to refer is discretionary at the first instance, uh, rather than mandatory. Uh, and in this case, the judge did actually refer the question and um, the, it, it gave a fairly positive result for the interpretation of the Habitats Directive. So I'll talk now about the validity reference based on the same project. So this is a second line of attack and it was essentially attacking the inclusion of this Shannon LNG terminal and pipeline on the union list of projects of common interest. Um, so this was under Regulation 347, 2013. And the argument here was that when the, the criteria for inclusion on the list were being uh, considered by the European Union and by kind of group member states and, and regulators, that they didn't include sustainability aspects in the cost-benefit analysis. And this is a mandatory requirement under the, the regulation. Um, it's also worth pointing out that inclusion on the list is subject to a member state approval, both under the regulation itself and under the, the treaty. Uh, and the list is renewed every four years. Uh, so in this case, the most recent list, the fourth list, was adopted by the European Commission on the 31st of October 2019. Uh, and we initiated, initiated judicial review proceedings within three months on the 30th of January 2020 this year. Uh, so the significance of the PCI designation is that it's, it gives priority status for project permitting. 
Uh, member states have to treat them with the most rapid treatment legally possible under national law. Uh, they have to provide a single competent authority to facilitate and coordinate the permitting. Uh, like generally, there's quite a, diff quite a lot of permits. So there might be planning permission, there might be emissions licensing, there might be, in Ireland, we have foreshore licensing if you want to build next to the, next to the, um, the, the shore uh, and so on. Um, they're also considered to be of public interest and there's a kind of a, a flag in the regulation that, that indicates that they may qualify for um, reasons of overriding public interest for the Habitats Directive and the Water Framework Directive. And, and there's also a possibility uh, to draw down union finance to, to construct them. Um, so when, we're, when you're, we were looking at this, um, you know, it, 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 I, I'm not sure if it, this has ever, had ever been done before. I think this, this may be one of the first, you know, it's certainly the first in Ireland, maybe the first in Europe where uh, an ENGO went and kind of basically went directly in and looked for a validity reference. Um, it, we, we couldn't find any other examples. Um, so we, so, but obviously we're aware that access, to, direct access to the Court of Justice is a major issue for ENGOs and obviously something that Client Earth has campaigned on for quite some time uh, with some, and with quite a, a high degree of success. Uh, as I think Anne or Leonor noted, the Aarhus Regulation Administrative Review is quite unsatisfactory both in terms of what can be reviewed and whether there's a judicial remedy at the end of it. Um, so if you look at the list of, of, of review applications, the degree of success is, is virtually zero uh, and the, um, the scope of judicial review is very, very limited just to procedural aspects really. So, so we, fe we felt that you would not, not be able to get to the Court of Justice to look at the actual validity of the regulation via the administrative review. And I think another NGO actually filed a request for administrative review and, and failed. So I think we were right on that. We also had to consider whether we could bring a direct action under Article 2634. But again, no ENGO has ever been able to meet the criteria of directly concerned by something like this. So <clears throat> we, 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 we felt that we didn't qualify um, uh, to take, uh, we, we didn't have standing under 2634. Uh, there's uncertainty at national level about how to actually request a preliminary reference when, when there's no uh, Im immediate implementation measure in place. Um, so there, there was a lot of uncertainty about how to approach it. So, so when we issued the proceedings, we kind of gave it our best shot. Um, and I, I should also mention that it wasn't just myself as the lawyer. We had two barristers, John Kenny and James Devlin, who had work, worked on this project and worked on the earlier case that I mentioned as well. So again, uh, no ENGO standing under the Article 263. How to, how to access the validity challenge, when to challenge it. Um, I'm not sure about in other systems, but in Ireland, if you have a choice, no matter which choice you take, you'll always be told you should have taken the other one. So, uh, and also the, the usual, your case is premature, both premature and out of time. So if you're challenging a national measure and challenging an EU measure, uh, you, you, you have to kind of um, balance the time, li time limits. So that's why we went in quite early. We actually went in before the uh, ADOPT, the Act had come into force. Uh, we, so to try and get our decision within the national law time limit for the national law decision. Um, and ultimately, we, we were able to, to pull that one off. The other issues were, it was very difficult to access information about the internal member state decision, or the decision making at the EU level. So there's basically very little in the public domain. Uh, some NGOs had done a access to information requests and they got some information, but it was fairly, fairly limited and not, nothing really in it. Uh, we discovered that there were no formal written decisions at the member state level, at, at the Irish level, in relation to some of the decisions that they had to take uh, in relation to the adoption of the project on the list. And then, and then there's very little guidance. There's no guidance in Irish law and very limited guidance from the ECJ and from the, the European Commission on how to do this. Um, so the, the, the case is called Friends of the Irish Environment versus 
um, the Irish Minister for Communications, Shan LNG. Um, there were two two reliefs. The primary one was a preliminary reference to the ECJ to determine the validity of that um, regulation insofar as it included the Shannon LNG project on the list. Uh, and I should say, like it, it com in comparison to the interpretive uh, preliminary reference, there's I think there's a less discretion on the court in terms of validity. Um, so they, 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 I think they have, they shall refer if they share the doubts of the applicant, rather than the kind of silfish uh, may refer if it's necessary to resol resolve the dispute. So if you can kind of get, if you can kind of get to the stage where the the court feels it has jurisdiction, um, I think you probably have a much better chance of actually getting a validity reference. But as we'll see, we, we didn't get to that point. Uh, and the secondary relief was that we wanted to quash Ireland's approval of the project based on its duty of sincere cooperation, i.e. that it should not uh, approve a project that didn't actually meet the criteria. Uh, and then also because it breached uh, or didn't, um, it didn't uh, comply with Irish uh, climate change law in how it assessed its decision making about the approval. Um, so again, the, the key issues are the gap between 263 and 267. So like the, 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 the case law from the Court of Justice says that the European system provides a complete system of judicial review. But, and I'm sure many NGOs share this view, it, it doesn't look complete when there's certain things that are virtually impossible or practically impossible to litigate at a European level. Uh, there was a kind of a procedural issue. Does the two-month limit under Article 263 apply to 267? The, the answer is no, unless you're actually trying to avoid it. Um, what's the definition of implementing measures for 263? Um, so we, we said that the member states kind of preparatory decisions leading up to the delegated act should be subject to judicial review in Ireland um, or could be used to launch a validity challenge. And also that uh, possible future implementing measures would be sufficient to ground a validity challenge at the moment. Uh, the state kind of pushed back and trying to frame it as a standalone validity reference, i.e. it was a pure reference to the to the Court of Justice on the validity without any uh, kind of national aspect. So there was no hook at national level to hook it onto. So therefore the court couldn't just make a standalone or a bare valid validity reference. And that, that was their strongest point, um, which kind of developed. They didn't they didn't figure it out at the start, but it, it became apparent as they went through the, the procedure. Um, so I think the, the key cases are these two cases, British American Tobacco and Intertanko, which are mentioned in the Commission staff working document on the, the reform of the R House regulation. And these are ones where the applicant challenged uh, the validity of, of directives before the transposition deadline had expired. And the Court of Justice accepted that a preliminary reference could be made in that context. But there's no case law that says where there's no, prelim no implementing measure, a validity reference can be made. That has never been resolved. And, I, and I'm not sure if anyone was on the Client Earth seminar last week or the week before, but a senior official from the Commission, I asked him that question and he said that where there are no implementing measures and you don't have standing for the Court of Justice, that the administrative review is your remedy, and, and that's it. So the, the outcome of this was that a judgment was handed down recently in the last month. The court refused to make a preliminary reference. Uh, it said that there must be a national implementing measure. Uh, it found that there were no implementing measures and there never will be, so therefore the British American Tobacco and Intertanko don't apply and it also said that Ireland's action as a member of the regional groups under the regulation wasn't amenable to judicial review independently of the Delegated Act. So therefore the court, in essence, lacked jurisdiction because as Leonora has pointed out, uh, the Court of Justice has the sole jurisdiction to determine the validity of European measures. Um, it's still before the National Court at first instance where the, the, the other points are being determined. Uh, and I think it's likely that we'll appeal this um, uh, so it's, it's kind of work in progress. And so hopefully uh, I might have an update for people uh, in the next uh, in the next uh, year to see where, where this goes. So I think that's it. 
Um, just on a, from a practical perspective, it, this was a very difficult case. Um, it, there was virtually nothing to try, nothing available to us to try and figure out whether it was a, a strong case or how to take it. Um, there, there's, there have been a few other scenarios, for example, the Schrems litigation, but there's nothing precisely like this. So I, I, my hope is that if it is appealed, that it'll give clarity to uh, NGOs, both in Ireland and further afield, about how to actually kind of construct cases around validity reference where the implementing measures aren't apparent or, or at an early stage uh, before the implement implementing measures are taken. Because like, if you think about it in, in terms of legal certainty, you don't want to have to wait for an implementing measure to bring your validity challenge. Ideally, you want to bring it as early as possible. Uh, and, that, and that suits everyone. That suits the, the, right, the, the states the, the, or the public authorities. Uh, it suits developers. So, so that's it. I think I've been cut off there. And I'm happy to answer questions, uh, both Yeah, maybe, yep. <laughs> sorry, friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks very much. I think you gave a really great kind of, uh, you know, practitioner's perspective and highlighted a lot of the practical challenges that we face in bringing um, uh, preliminary references and, and convincing courts to make preliminary references, both interpretive references and validity. And it also really interestingly showed the, um, the, the interplay between both types of procedure as well. Um, so thanks very, very much for that. Um, we've had some really interesting questions, so I think we can go, we'll go through these um, one by one and answer them to the, to the best of our ability. So I think I'll just start at the top um, so that we can all keep track of, of where we are. So the first question from Mario uh, Pagano, where he says, what's the most effective tool to bring EU national legislation into compliance with the Aarhus Convention? on access to access to justice. So on the one hand, there's the preliminary reference procedure that we've spoken about. So we can ask the, uh, bring a national challenge and ask the national judge to refer a question on interpretation of those access to justice obligations. And that will then be binding on the, on the national court and also in the EU at large. Um, and the other avenue is um, to go through the international routes. So the Irish Convention has its own compliance committee that we've spoken about that can um, adopt findings on the on on whether a, a, a signatory, a party that has ratified the convention, is in compliance with it. So, what is the most effective tool? So, uh, of course, in a client Earth, I can answer from a client Earth perspective because we use uh, both. Tools, and obviously it often depends on the on the situation, the normal lawyer answer. Um, so of course you highlight that costs are, uh, are a serious um, consideration when you're bringing litigation because the Arhus Convention Compliance Committee making a complaint is obviously free of charge and you don't have to have a, a lawyer to, um, to submit you know, your, your complaint for you, so you don't have that external cost. Um, and that, 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 that is, a, is a very serious consideration for NGOs, especially small ones with very limited economic uh, and financial resources. Um, but also, um, the other main consideration for us in deciding which avenue to go is when we simply don't have standing in the national court to, 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 to bring the case and to therefore ask the court to make a preliminary reference. So that's the case for just now. We have quite a lot of, uh, we have some clean air litigation in Poland and we have been refused standing um, in all instances right up to the um, um, at Su Supreme Administrative Court. Um, so there's no right of appeal after that. They've refused to hear our, our case, um, despite the very clear case law from the Court of Justice in both the Janicek and the Klein Earth cases on access to justice to challenge clean air uh, air quality programs. Um, so in that case, we've done, we've had to bring a, a complaint to the compliance committee because of that lack of standing. So that's kind of an example that really clarifies why sometimes one, one avenue is better than the other. Um, Having said that, I'm not sure if we can say that most many NGOs still prefer the, the, the compliance committee. I think there's 
a lot of uh, national litigation ongoing all over the EU to, to try to enforce these access to justice rights. And we're seeing a lot of preliminary reference judgments that are really helping helping us. So, um, so I'm not sure if one is just kind of preferred over the other. I think it really depends on, on, on the case and the strengths of the case and the financial resources of the, of the applicant uh, in question. Um, yeah, so that would be my answer to that. And please feel free, anyone else, uh, Fred or, or, or Leonor, to. Yeah, well, there's a, from my yeah. point of view, there's, there's, two, there's two aspects. Firstly, the preliminary reference is, is interpretation of EU law. And the compliance committee is the implementation of the Aarhus Convention, so they're not they're not identical. They're they're, they're overlapping certainly, but they're not the same thing. Uh, and the second thing is uh, that the the compliance committee is getting particularly now is getting more strict on exhaustion of domestic remedies. So you can't just go to the compliance committee without at least giving a very good ex explanation of why you can't um, li uh, litigate it in your in your national court. So, for example, like Anne has said, they've been denied standing at all levels, so they've no option. So I think if, if you're looking at something, I think the first port of call will always be a national remedy. Two excellent points. Um, okay, the next question is from Andrea Longo uh, to, to Lena. So, he, yes, three points. Okay, so could you elaborate a bit more on the potential role of preliminary reference procedure as a tool to enforce human rights in the EU? Um, I think that your question is kind of specifically uh, in relation to NGOs uh, enforcing human human rights um, before the, the Court of Justice of the EU. So the second part is when we deal with public interest litigation, it is not necessarily easy to meet the legal standing to file a complaint before a national judge. Um, so I, I'm not, I have to say that I'm not a human rights expert, um, but I think that both uh, in terms of the ECHR and in the EU, um, for NGOs to enforce human rights is kind of a long-standing issue uh, and, and, and problem. And my understanding is that there's no kind of automatic right for NGOs to have access to national courts to enforce uh, human rights under EU law as a matter of EU law. I don't, I, I, as far as I'm aware, that's not the case, and it will depend very much on the on the specific fundamental right. Because under EU law, it would be more about uh, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. I think it would depend on the specific fundamental right that you're trying to to enforce. But um, it's, whereas under the Aarhus Convention, we have quite clear NGOs have a very um, specific role to play in enforcing uh, environmental law and uh, rights on access to justice. Um, I don't believe that's generally the case for human rights at, at the moment. Um, but um, please feel free to, to pitch in. I think it's also worth noting that the preliminary reference procedure does not um, influence the standing because uh, standing for NGOs are, if, if you if we are talking about national courts, you have to check your national procedural rules. And usually, you, as you said, if you are an NGO, you want to to bring a case before a national court. You have to consider the scope of your NGO. So if you if you have an environmental NGO, you can you can bring cases before the national court on environmental matters. But this has to be regarding national law. Um, so either you have standing or you don't. The the, re the preliminary reference procedure is is a sub subsequent question. Um, your ability to 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 start a, a, to refer a question to the court of justice does not have to do with your standing. You have to first pass the st the standing test and then you can refer the question. Of course, of course, <laughs> access to the national court and having standing is a matter of EU law because it's ratified the Aarhus Convention, um, and I. Is what I'm saying is that I don't think there's an equivalent for human rights, and that yeah. showing victim status for for uh, for NGOs is a is a long going and much debated question. But it's not my area of expertise. I have to I have to admit. Um, but I hope that was helpful in any case to some extent. Um, moving down, Noel um, asks that um, 
says that in France, there's almost no possibility to use injunctive relief in order to get environmental information. I wonder if there could exist an obligation for French courts to refer, refer to the CEDU a question regarding this subject. Um, I think I'll pass that straight over to Fred, who is a real expert on, <laughs> on access to environmental information in Ireland, at least. Uh, for me, I, I know much more about accessing environmental information from the EU uh, institutions. Um, as a starting point, I think this would be a matter, the first question is, is as a matter of EU law, is there a right to injunctive relief um, under the Directive on Access to Environmental Information? But I'll, I'll see if Fred wants to expand on that. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, <laughs> uh, it's hard enough to get it without injunctive relief. Um, <laughs> but, but obviously, Article 9.4 of is the over, is the overrides overriding um, criteria for all uh, aspects of um, uh, the Aarhus Convention. So 9.1.9.2.9.3, and it says that there should be the possibility of interim measures or injunctive relief. Um, I, I, it's it's hard to answer the question without understanding the precise context, but uh, I can give a plug for another one of my clients, Right to Know, who have just got a preliminary findings from the con the compliance committee that says that um, that the court rem the judicial remedy for uh, uh, access to environmental information has to meet the Article Five Nine Four criteria of being um, uh, fair, equitable, and timely. So. That it has to take into account the uh, the how its order will be applied and to ensure that it meets the standards of Article Nine Four. So I I think if uh, Noel that might be a project you could take up and try and figure out how to get that before the compliance committee. Uh, I'd encourage you to do that. It's for, definitely for... an interesting question. From my experience uh, in trying to get access to information from EU institutions. Uh, my experience is that injunctive relief is mostly um, uh, given to the other side. So, for example, if I'm trying to get information that um, uh, originated with a company, it's usually the company that gets injunctive relief to stop the environmental information being disclosed to me. So, it's a it's a very in it's a very interesting question from the other perspective. Um, finally, there's a question from Anna to Leonor. Uh, could you please comment on the level of awareness of judicial magistrates for the preliminary reference obligations uh, in countries which have tra traditionally very low litigation rates? That's a, an interesting question and perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, I think if you if you check the, um, the latest um, report from the European Commission, on the justice scoreboard across the EU, you can see you can see um, various data regarding the awareness of um, judicial magistrates regarding EU law, and you will see that despite some countries having traditionally very low litigation, sometimes they are uh, nonetheless very aware of EU law aspects. So I don't think there is really a connection there, just because you have very low litigation rates that the the judicial magistrates are not so aware but what i also know is that traditionally very low litigation rates are also connected to lack of access to justice because um in fact disputes are a matter of the human condition where there are humans there are disputes and litigation rates uh, go go up when when access to court is easier when you don't have uh, exorbitant costs when you have um criteria for standing there is broader um, so, so if if you if you mix all those those elements, you will see that if you have great access to justice, you will have higher litigation rates. But if you have um, low litigation rates and and a good access to justice, you will have a higher um, a, a level of awareness of the judicial magistrates. And and this is uh, also connected with, for example. I understand you are Portuguese. Portugal has a very high level of awareness of EU law, but we still have very few preliminary reference procedure comparing to Belgium, who has double the amount of the preliminary reference procedure. So something is is lacking here. Um, I'm not sure what it is, but but it's definitely a, a, an interesting an interesting point to consider. Thanks, Leonor. 
Um, we have another question from Mikael. I'm so sorry if this is not how you pronounce your name. Um, and it says, could Article 19 one, second par subparagraph of uh, the Treaty on European Union help ENGOs to gain standing at national level? And how do you see the role uh, of, the, of the mentioned provision? Um, <clears throat> yes, I think Article 19 has played a really crucial role already in the case law of the, of the Court of Justice in its preliminary reference judgments on access to justice at national level. Um, and I'm just going to immediately refer you to, and I'm gonna put up a slide later so that you can you can actually um, download all of these materials, but we have quite, a, we've got a really, um, we've produced quite a detailed um, handbook on access to justice in EU law. And that really goes into the detail of a lot of, a lot of the case law on access to justice for NGOs and this, um, Article 19 is, is indeed, um, uh, you know, mentioned in there because it has been extremely helpful uh, uh, so far. So I'm just going to refer you directly to the, to the materials, uh, if that's okay. Um, and then, oh goodness me, this is a this is a, a question on the new um, Office for Environmental Protection in the UK. Um, now that. Uh, now that the UK has has left the European Union and we do no longer have the um, the benefit of the infringement proceedings brought by the Commission and the case law of the Court of Justice um, on access to justice, so um, I have to. I'm just going to say up front that I am not an expert on um, the uh, on you know the post Brexit environmental legislation that's being passed in the UK. I have to say that um, probably. For my mental health, I kind of switched off from from it. But I do have client, I do have colleagues and client Earth who are very devoted to following it and who are working on it. And I can perhaps send you Paul um, some of their materials that they are they're working on, and um, which deal with exactly these questions. But I am I'm afraid not the the expert on that. Um, but perhaps someone else has been following it a bit more closely. Well, well, I, I can comment because I live in a country that actually shares a border with the UK, uh, and it, it highlights the importance of the Aris Convention and the ESPO Convention, because obviously the UK will still be parties to those. Uh, and I think um, there, there's, there's, you probably will see something uh, to strengthen those, particularly in between Northern Ireland and Ireland, to, to prevent a kind of a, a race to the bottom in terms of regulation. Um, because there's a lot of, say, for example, intensive agriculture uh you know uh, chickens and things like that um which have uh, spillover effects in terms of um just the the economics and in terms of the environment so i i, I think there there will be there'll be a lot of focus on on the transboundary consultations and on the rs convention uh compliance in the uk and um uh, so I think it goes back to that the, the question about the IRS convention and the preliminary reference. So they're, they're two different things. So I think we will need to be relying on the IRS convention a lot in, ca in cases of environmental issues that affect Ireland particularly, but there, there's other transboundary effects, maybe in the, say, for example, in, in the marine context or fishing context, uh, which might be relevant as well. Um, yeah, and just to point out that there are... Um a couple of, uh, or at least a couple more than that, um, cases already before the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee on access to justice in the UK. One is on costs, and there's another very interesting one on the standard of review that's undertaken by the UK courts when they when they review um, acts of the of the executive, and that they're going to be very interesting to watch now as we see the the UK um, embark on a review of of judicial review and what that actually means. And I agree that there are some very, very worrying developments for access to justice um, in the UK. And I think you're muted. Sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so I think if we have no more questions, then we can perhaps uh, conclude the, the, the webinar with six minutes to, to spare.
Um, so thank you very much, especially to Fred and to Leonor for contributing to this this webinar. It was uh, it, you, it was very valuable indeed, and thank you very much for the questions and for making it a very lively and uh, an interesting uh, discussion. Um, so uh, here is the slide that I was going to. Uh, show you, which um, gives the information on some of the materials that we have developed during the course of this project. Um, and you can also sign up for a newsletter where we routinely analyse the case law of the Court of Justice on access to just um, on access to justice and some significant national judgments as well. There, you can find, for example, analysis of the preliminary reference procedures that uh, Fred has spoken about and pretty much all of them that come out as and when they come out. So um, feel free to sign up to that if you, are, if you are interested. And thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye.